So my name's Belinda Bailey, and I'm the Sustainable Farming Manager for Syngenta. And my role within Syngenta is to, to look after the, the number of environmental projects that we have, and this is one of them. Straight to go away. So the project uh, was started back in 2017, where we started our first pilot site here in the UK. And we're part of a, a wider European project working with um, expert partners. So here in the UK, we've got NIAB and GWCT. And from Spain, we've got the European Conservation Agricultural Federation. And the UK are part of um, the project with also France and Spain. We're now four years into the project, and we are now bringing other countries from Europe in, like Denmark, um, they've got Portugal, um, Hungary, uh, Romania, etc., joining, joining in. The project we set up with the purpose of looking at uh, conservation agricultural principles and systems in a serial-based type rotation, so we could understand how growers can adopt in a, a faster way and understanding the challenges along the way. We also have various other partners involved in the project to, to support us with this. So we've got two sites here in the UK. The first one we started, as I said, in 2017 at Loddington, the Allerton project. This site is a predominantly heavy clay soil type with a challenge of black grass like many others. So a lot of the decisions that were made on farm is on that controlling the black grass. After the end of the first year, we then are, are lucky enough to be hosted by Andy Barr and his farm down in Lenham in Kent. And this site is quite different to uh, the Loddington site because it's a much um, lighter land sandy soil type. And we specifically wanted to do this, so we've now got two sort of extremes of soil types so we can test these different systems in two very different soils. So what are we doing? We are looking on a farm scale, so everything that's done is done by Andy and Phil and his team, and we are looking in a five-year cereal rotation. So at Loddington, we have um, winter wheat, winter barley, winter oil seed rape, and then a spring crop of spring beans. That's the plan. The plans don't always go to, uh, to fruition every year, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. So um, then at Lenham, we're still within a five-year rotation, but because the site came into the project a year after, we're looking at four fields. So again, very similar rotation, except for Andy grows spring barley rather than winter barley. So the three systems we have, they're in each field. We have a conventional system where we are doing the, the, the plowing, and we're plowing to sort of depths of 15, 20 centimetres. Our next system we've called Sustainable System 1, where we've gone to a min-till approach. So we're cultivating still to sort of a depth of 15 centimetres. But also we start to include green cover crops, which we are planting ahead of any spring crop that's going in. And then our final system we're calling Sustainable System 2, where this is really where we're trying to go to a direct drill approach. And at Lenham we are direct drilling, but at, at Loddington, on the high, heavier soil type, we are um, occasionally having to do a, a light cultivation. So we, we, we're calling this a light till, no till system. And again, we're including the green covers in that. So what are the sort of things that we're measuring? We've, we're, we're measuring a, a huge amount of different areas. So we can really get an understanding around the profitability food production, but also environmental considerations as well. So if we start just looking at the graph here, we've got agronomy. So we're measuring the, the germination crop plant establishment. We're looking at green area index. And then we're also uh, monitoring for, for weeds, uh, diseases, and any pests differences that we can pick up between these three different systems. We also look at the field um, cultivations activities, and we're measuring the time it takes to cultivate. Uh, we are measuring the fuel use and we are doing the cost for every operation throughout the season. We then are looking at the productivity, so the, the, the outputs on yield, and we'll also measure any quality traits as well from the grains. This then leads us towards the, the profitability, where we are considering the, the, the revenue, income revenue, and the grain prices that we use, we're using standard AD, AHDB prices, and what we've done is looked at the median price, but also then done calculations at the average low price 
and then a high price to see how this can have an impact on our bottom line. What we've also got here then, we move on to the, the environmental considerations. So we've been looking at uh, bird counts through the winter months, seeing what birds are, are utilizing the different systems. We are measuring lots of different soil health aspects from um, worm counts. We're doing biological activity through the tea bag testing. We're looking at soil compaction and soil structure. Um, and um, we're also looking at so nutrients, uh, uh, etc. So we have a wide range. Sorry, that's gone back um, of, of different uh, outputs. So where have we where have we got to so far? So we are now at the end. We're in the middle of year four. So we've got three years of results from Loddington and two years of results from Lenham. And what I have done here is just given some examples of some of the outputs that we've got, and we will discuss in more detail with our panel group. The, the, the figures so far. So what I've done is averaged the results from our sustainable system two against the conventional plow-based system. And as you can see, as a highlight and a bottom line, we are seeing that on both sides average that we can increase our net profitability by moving to the sustainable system two, the light till direct drill system, compared to a conventional. And how did we get to those figures? Well, obviously, we measured the yield, and we are finding that we have seen a slight reduction in the yields from moving to these systems. And that is something that, as we move forward this, with this project, it's something that we need to address and see how we can um, improve that situation. We've looked at, then at the grain margin, and what you can see that actually at Lenham, with all the savings that we make from time and costs, that um, the margin, the grain margin, we are seeing a profit but it's more challenging at Loddington, and we, we're finding that um, at the moment we, we still are having a, a slight decline in that gross margin. So what other things have we, we noticed? We are finding that we are um, reducing our fuel use by up to 50, 65 percent, and we're, we're also increasing our work rate for up to 50 percent. So we, get, we, can, we have 50 percent extra time to get those cultivations done and, and crops drilled. And then our, we've seen a reduction in those overall operation costs through that growing season. So those are sort of the, some of the benefits that we're picking up from the, the, the sustainability of food production. But then if we also look at the, some of the environmental impacts that we're having on the, from these three different systems, we've seen that we, ha we get more bird sightings on the sustainability plots during those winter months than we have with the conventional. We're also seeing greater number of earthworms in the sustainable system too, compared to the conventional. And then we're also measuring soil gas emissions, which we're seeing a reduction in the total amount of CO2 equivalent. So what we're doing here is measuring CO2 gas release from the soil, methane, and nitrous oxide. And then we're looking at our overall carbon footprint of the, the operations of, of, the, um, of, the, of the systems. So those are just some of the headline results that we have got. And what I'm going to do now is hand over to Phil, who is going to take us through a, a deeper dive and look at some of these results. Thank you. Okay. So um, you can see on the screen here about uh, the impact of the, the results across the board. So if you're looking from bird sightings all the way across to earthworm numbers, crop establishment, very simple code. If it's got green on the top of it, it's better. If it's red, it's not as good. And I'm really going to use this as the basis of some of the questions that we're going to ask a bit later on. Um, we're also going to ask a few questions about the challenges in the system. This isn't all plain sailing. There's more management involved. Uh, and I'm going to bring in the panel as well to do that. So we have a roving mic, I believe. Um, but first of all, I'm going to introduce Mark Hall, who, uh, Mark, you're head of sustainable uh, and responsible business. Uh, Europe, Africa, and Middle East, so I, for Syngenta, so I imagine that includes Stevenage postcodes as well. <laughs> it does. Yeah, excellent. And, and indeed, you're a gentive farmer or on that journey yourself as a farmer? Yeah, my wife and I took on a farm up in Bedfordshire last year uh, next to my father's farm, and we've just uh, we've set that up as a regenerative system. So we're going through the, the process of learning, as is everybody else. Yeah. It's a good word, a little stumble before the word process. It is a learning, a learning process. I'm also joined on my right here by uh, Andy Barr, who, as you saw, is one of the uh, farmers in the trial in Europe. Um, 
and also on my left here, Dr. Alistair Leake, who is the head of the Allerton Project and very instrumental in, in coordinating it and, and with myself at Loddington uh, running the, the uh, challenges on heavy land, should I say, Alistair. Um, so uh, if, if, we have, if we have any questions, but I might just start while we're thinking of questions to the audience, is to, is to turn to Mark and say, Mark, Syngenta, getting involved in regenerative agriculture, not something that's, but you've done a lot of work in the past. Why, why the interest in regenerative agriculture? Well, thanks, Phil. Yeah, w I think we're interested in any of the systems of agriculture, to be honest with you. Um, and, and partly what's driving that, of, of course, is that the policy environment that the European Union and the, and the UK is steering us towards is, is towards lower pesticide use. And in fact, what I would term as a, a different level of agronomy or integrated pest management 2.0, I think. Um, and I think that's really interesting. In fact, from a research and development, from a science perspective, you know, the seeds and crop protection businesses that come under Syn Syngenta Group are, are, are very excited by the possibilities of this. The focus is coming a little bit away from yield to a more holistic approach to integrated crop management. And that's, that's something that we feel that from a science perspective we can contribute to. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Alastair, if I just turn to you now and about the overall concept of this project and it's, you know, the number of years now, it's into its fourth year. What are the sorts of things that have interested you uh, that's come out of it? You know, some of them are on the graph, uh, infographic behind you. Yeah, yeah, I think the, the problem I, I find with this whole systems uh, approach is that, is that we, in the past we've tended to be quite simplistic and Mark alluded to the, you know, yield being the holy grail for many, many years. And then as we start to look at our fixed costs and the environmental impacts, it becomes apparent that we actually need to look at a much wider range of factors. And I think this is going to become increasingly important. We've got an environment bill going through Parliament at the moment in which the polluter pays principle is included within that. So that is a potential tax on um, diffuse pollution coming from agriculture. On the other hand, we also have a new scheme coming in which is going to pay public money for public goods that farmers might deliver. So there's a reward element to have there. But we can't claim our reward unless we know what systems deliver it. And I think what this is showing, for instance, and one of the components which I think is particularly innovative that this study is doing, is measuring greenhouse gas emissions from soil under different cultivation regimes. Because we need to bear in mind that you might be lo uh, loading the soil up with a lot of carbon, uh, but if you're emitting nitrous dioxide because of poor structural conditions, then the net effect on greenhouse gases is far worse, bearing in mind nitrous oxide is 265 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. So without measuring and knowing the outcomes fully of each system, you can't properly evaluate the pros and cons. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Alistair. Just before I ask some questions from the audience here, Andy, I'm going to turn, let's talk farming now on the, on the, on the, on the shop floor, as it were. Um, me and Andy might have a discussion for a little while about this, but what interests you in going into a project and trying out all these cultivation methods? You know, what, what's interesting and what have you learned, really? Well, yeah, I'd been, um, when I was approached, I'd already been, I hadn't ploughed since year 2000. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, really, I... I was hoping, I was convinced that I was doing the right thing, or I was hoping I was doing the right thing, but, uh, and I'd done my own trials, and, uh, but of course, these are entirely different. They're all independent, run by NIAB. There's nowhere to hide, really. You can't kind of go, oh, well, you know, that didn't work, but I'll, I'll do better next time. And um, so that was something that really interested me. I was really apprehensive, actually, had I been losing money over 20 years when I could have been doing it differently. Uh, so that was one thing. But the other thing, well, I've, I've been quite frustrated during the 2000s when I was looking to go direct drilling. Uh, there was a lot of direct drilling trials being kind of shoehorned into conventional systems and actually coming out quite badly. So I thought that would be a challenge if we can actually, you know, my system was already direct drilling, so to see what that was. And also, as Alistair has referred to, some of the, the measurements, I could never do measuring nitrous oxide, you know, bird counts, you know, worm numbers, things like that. Uh, so some of the more detail uh, was really appealing as well. 
Yeah, it would be fair to say that there are you know, several thousand pieces of data, I think over 10,000 pieces of data in this study. So behind the scenes, there's a good team of number crunches as well. Um, so do we, do we have any questions out of the audience at all? Has anybody got something that they'd like to know about, particularly those figures on the board or in general about this project? So we've got one down here at the front. front on the. Just, if you can just wait for the microphone so it, the sound picks up. Apparently you can't touch the microphone, you've just got to talk into it. Okay. Um, you've obviously got some encouraging results on the board there from your changing the cultivation system. Um, have you noticed uh, any difference in the, in the level of inputs? Have you been able to reduce inputs as well as cultivation and diesel inputs? So, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether Belinda or Alistair, Alistair perhaps, you know, um, this around time and, and diesel. Uh, yeah, the, the, the diesel inputs are definitely reduced. Um, f for me, actually, the, the, the key figure that comes out of this is that the work rate is 50% faster. And we know that uh, crop of wheat sown at Loddington in mid-September will yield a tonne a hectare more than one sown in mid-October. That's assuming you can get on the soil in mid-October. So you're getting more of your crop in, in in better conditions, and that means it's going to compete better with the weeds and, and yield better better too. Um, the input we've not been able to manipulate because it would have affected the comparison with the system is the amount of nitrogen we're applying. Uh, and that is quite key actually. But we can model that because we've been taking soil mineral nitrogen samples from all three systems and using that as a base we can put it into the uh, end tester model and come out with what the expected amount of nitrogen would be. And I'm predicting from that that will show some savings in nitrogen uh, on the plow system, where you mineralize more compared to the uh, non-disturbance system. But of course, that, that, that nitrogen comes at a cost in terms of lost carbon. Yeah. So that's why this is so important that we're measuring everything. So um, it would be fair to say Mark talked about IPM 2.0. It would be fair to say in conservation agriculture 2.0, this has been a cultivation trial. I think the next point now is let's start manipulating the inputs because then we could, we're could we pretty much sure what the cultivation's done. What can we do with inputs? We've got a question here from Stafford. Uh, thank you, Phil. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, there's some marvelous results up there and it's it's really um, clearly laid out for us. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, a, a, a question on the detail. Um, the grain margin, when, when I first looked at it, I, I think I read it as gross margin, but uh, but can you explain, for example, in the in the um, uh, in the Lenham site, when when the yield is going down, therefore you would expect the because the inputs are all the same, the gross margin would go down. Where exactly the grain margin, uh, in terms of pounds per hectare, why is that going up in that that uh, model? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just I'll come to Andy in a minute on that, but I think this is around. There's savings in cultivation costs, but there's also savings in fixed costs because the system has less machinery in it. So that's actually, if you add that to your margin, that's where you're getting it. So Andy, do you want to just expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, no, we have, we've made huge savings in operation costs, basically, and, and the fixed costs. So that's where, the, that's where the increased margin comes from. I'm slightly frustrated. We, we're down 2.7%, I think, exactly, in, is, the, uh, is the figure in the yield. And I think the question for me I think we can get it equal, at least. The question, that's the question for me, and this is how I'm learning from this project, because you've got all three systems alongside, and you can, there's no hiding. You can think, oh, God, in that year, the plowing did do a little bit better. And actually, it's not the winter crops, it's the spring crops where we've seen it. And uh, so I'm really learning, you know, the spring beans, which we thought were great, you know, were fine in direct drilling with a tie and just really suited, have not, has not suited them. Um, we've had uh, seasons where we've gone from wet to dry in literally a few hours, and I've tweaked the uh, I've now tweaked the setup on my drill to protect the seed more in the direct drilling, and I think that's really that's helped. So I'm hoping if you come back and hear it in two years, I will be at least at, at uh, no difference. We're going to explore some of those red figures as well in a bit more detail. So I'm just giving Alistair a heads up here now in a, in a minute, but um, it would be fair to say that. Um, in the light till system, if you adopt that light till system, you probably end up with one less tractor or and cultivator. Whereas if you're in the min till system, it might just be the cultivator. Uh, if you then add that into the, the time and operation savings, that's why it changes its dynamic. And often we're measuring 
yield is how productive we are. Yes, production, but profitable, it's the end game there. So that's why there's a difference in those figures. We've, we've got a question uh, uh, here on the right. Yeah. Um, Tom from Southern Water. Um, yeah, really interesting outcomes. I suppose re re aligned to the previous question, so um, it, what, what standard of wheat were you growing to? Was it milling or, or um, feed wheat that you're growing to? And are there any sort of implications in terms of those numbers from that? And then can you talk us through a bit more about the differences with, the, oh, I suppose, the management requirements around the heavy land system as well and, you know, the kind of yeah. constraints that you get with yeah. the drilling on You that. got to the nub of the question there. Well done. That's excellent. Um, so around milling wheat or, or feed wheat, Andy, on your... I, I grow milling. Yeah. I grow milling and malting barley and, you know, that's the market in Kent, so... Yeah, so at Loddington it would probably be group fours, it would be, uh, or, or group three, so it would be biscuit or, 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 or hard wheat group fours. Um, one of the reasons is we're 600 feet above sea level and if we get milling wheat, you can bet your bottom dollar the rest of the country have got it because of our late harvest, so that, that's one of the reasons. Um, and, the, and the second part of the question was around, yeah, heavy land. So Andy, I'll, we'll just talk about heavy land here. So what about your soil type? Yeah, so we, the, the, where we're doing the trials is specifically designed to be a light land site. So we're doing it on sand, we're doing it on chalks, you know, the heaviest we've got the, it's on a kind of medium silty clay loam. But we do have uh, a, a patch of wheel clay in the middle of the farm. I have all sorts. And I do have more challenges there, like, like uh, Bill will refer to at Loddington. However, I think there's, there's, there's different challenges and there's different advantages. I remember when I was young, you know, bumbling up and down on a power harrow for hours on end, trying to knock down large concrete lumps into smaller concrete lumps. And, and now on that soil, after 20 years of not ploughing, you just got to, you know, if you'd told me less tillage would mean a better seed bed, you'd gone, what? I don't understand. But, you know, now the seed bed is just there and it's brilliant. The challenge, of course, is later drilling and spring drilling, which is how we've managed to, we, we've really expanded our, our cropping in the, in the no-till system. And that is the challenge on the heavier land. And we've, we've brought in things like grass seed, we've brought in herbal lays, we will make use of the AB15 fallow. Um, yeah, so there are, there are different, op, uh, different pros and different cons, I think, on the different land. But uh, obviously at Loddington, you've, you've got the heavier land everywhere. You did well to remember your childhood because I've forgotten mine, so <laughs> well, well done. Um, before I bring Mark, I might bring Mark in again before we go to another question, but Alistair, let's just take in the challenge of lighter land and heavier land and some of the red figures there around uh, crop establishment and yield and, and, and the challenges that we faced around, around this system on a heavy land. Yeah, I think that, that there's no doubt that with, with, with climate change and weather pressures, it's, it's making this system more challenging on, on heavy land. But that's not actually news to us. I mean, you know, I've been in this decades and, and we've always found that the very sandy soils and the very heavy soils are the really difficult ones to do. Uh, and with the, 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 the soils that are in the middle, um, all you have to do on some of those is remember to put the seed in, in the ground and it, it, it grows. And actually, Phil, although you always portray that Loddington is heavy land, it is predominantly but I notice in the fields where we have the lighter patches, they are always the, the bits that look the best. And the, the, the yield meter on the combine shows it too. So just slightly less clay in those then, yeah. Okay, so um, moving, Mark, just a, a word about um, the challenges and how we might use technology in the future and how you know, companies like Syngenta might help us with trying to bridge that gap to, to address some of these issues. It's a fast moving market, isn't it? It is, Phil, yeah. The, um, you know, studies like this we're investing in because it's giving us the pointers as to where we need to invest our time and money, and particularly our research and development effort. You know, our research and development effort has been focused on new genetics and finding new molecules to sell as crop protection products. But now we've got a real opportunity to start to put some more pieces of this jigsaw together, uh, and that is using precision technology to help pinpoint crop protection product use much more uh, um, in, a, in a targeted manner. But it's also around understanding much more about what's going on in the soil and understanding uh, the, the, the negative aspects as well as the positive aspect, aspects and how we uh, encourage the positive aspects. So 
we, you know, we're hiring soil scientists at the moment to help us to unpick some of the detail of that within regenerative agriculture and get us to understand those pieces. But the technology space for us is a, is a much wider space and an exciting space for a company like Syngenta and one that R&D or our R&D business is beginning to really shift its focus towards. Yeah, just before I come to Tony, I'll just, Belinda, I just wanted to just add on the top, not just technology, but um, Syngenta has been involved in things like Operation Pollinator and some green headland work as well. So, you know, this balance between productive agriculture and actually perhaps framing our fields with, with what, and we'll see plenty of it around here about um, natural-based solutions as well, helping, taking some pressure off perhaps plant protection products. You know, Syngenta has been in this game a, a fair while, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. We uh, started really, it was back in 2000 with our very first environmental project, which was uh, looking at pollinators and how we can support growers in um, providing habitats to, uh, specifically at that time, it was to increase bumblebees. And, um, you know, that project w was uh, originated from, from the UK and now is, is, is a global project project and develop and developed and expanded uh, over the years and we've we've managed to learn a huge amount about pollination pollination services um, benefits to to growers uh, by putting these env environmental habitats in so not only do they support the environment but how can that actually bring a benefit to the farm business uh, as well so this is a, an, an evolution and a, a progress on from wh where we started 20 plus years ago and we'll be uh, talk, we'll be I, I, sh I should actually mention that a lot of that work kicked off with, um, with Alistair and with Phil, and you've been major contributors to, um, to that work in encouraging us to continue to invest in this. And uh, it's been a wor great working relationship and one that's uh, uh, been very fruitful for, um, for uh, pollinator services, ecosystem services, or at least the start of ecosystem services. And, and we've rolled that out, as Belinda said, worldwide now. And we'll be talking pollinators and natural-based solutions at 11 o'clock at the soil tent, just in case you want to continue this. M moving along, Tony. Um, yeah. um, from a practical point of view, um, uh, th thinking about talking about extremes of soil, um, uh, particularly from my point of view, the, the heavy land, um, we, s we started our journey uh, w with this about... Uh, 13, 14 years ago, um, sort of moving from really from one extreme to the other, the really intense cultivations to, to, to sort of nothing. Um, and uh, as that went along, we certainly um, uh, appreciated the, the, the increasing uh, biology of the soil that was happening because of that. Um, and as I say, we're, we're heavy land which is clay and silt based, which is possibly the, 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 the worst really for um, sort of natural running together. Um, and we very much found that we've got to move to uh, some form of soil movement um, uh, uh, to, to, to sort of help it along. Um, and we sort of feel a, a, a low disturbance loosening about sort of six inches is uh, uh, the, the way that's beneficial to us um, and, and as I say low disturbance so not moving the surface too much but I'm just wondering um, you know from a practical farmer point of view um, is there any work being done to sort of evaluate what you actually can do to the soil uh, and keep the biology moving in the right direction where is the sort of level that you do too much and it's going backwards um, and but but keeping that biology moving in the right direction is, is vital, as right, well yeah. as some loosening. Okay, it. so that hashtag roots not iron, but possibly roots with a little bit of iron, and a hashtag keep the, keep the microbes going. Alistair, this sounds like a, one for you. Um, so work on, we've been measuring uh, soil biological activity with the tea bag test, for example. Perhaps we could allude on Tony's question about how much cultivation can we do, and, and not just uh, soil activity, but earthworm numbers as well? Yeah, so the, the beauty of doing this trial at Loddington and putting all the resources into the measurements means that we can also compare it to some of the uh, components of the trial which we've looked at separately. And we reach exactly the same conclusion as you clearly have, that as you go into the transition, 
before the earthworm numbers are able to build up, you start to get a tightening of the soil, okay? And that's bad news for cropping, but also it's bad news for the earthworms because they can't move about and feed quite so well. It's also bad news for nitrous oxide because when soils tighten, particularly in warm and wet conditions, nitrous oxide emissions go up. So we're trying to target our loosening to optimize all those different factors. And we found in the one field where we've been doing this, we, 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 we went in and used the uh, subsoiler in year zero. And then when we got to year four, using a penetrometer, we were able to find that we needed to go again. So we did go again, but we measured the earthworms before and afterwards and found that they were not significantly affected by that operation, which if you think about it, it's probably logical. It's very different from the huge disturbance that a plough brings in. What that loosening did was to give the earthworms the possibility to develop, and they went from a, a, a base point of 200 per square metre to 700 per square metre. So that is really good. Now, the downside of that is when you start to get that number of earthworms, you start to get a lot of carbon dioxide coming out of the soil because a bit like us, the more lively we are, the more CO2 comes out of us. Well, soil is just the same. Uh, the key thing is that what we've managed to do simultaneously with that is build the organic matter at the same time. So we're getting to this sweet spot where we need to be at with more carbon in the soil but more activity resulting from the carbon in the soil. And the icing on the cake is that that soil is now more resilient to both heavy rainfall and drought conditions because of the amount of pore space in it. That pore space, remember, is what buffers you against drought and flooding because it, it provides that flexibility in, in taking up moisture. Thanks, Alistair. So we were meant to be joined by um Nathan Morris today, and, and while we're talking about soil, Nathan can't be with us. I'm not sure whether it's an IT um, issue or a desire to be down a, in a soil pit somewhere. So, I, Andy, we'll continue the thing of soil before we go to a question at the back here. What about things like compaction, earthworm numbers, soil health? You know, often we've talked about a lot of things about facts and figures here, but down on the ground, decisions that we make, you know, what, what have you seen on your farm? Are really uh, very similar very similar experiences to you, Tony, and on that. Uh, so we've tried a million different things over the years, and we went gradually over 20 years, well, over 10 years from ploughing to, to no-till, and we've ended up with a grassland subsoiler, very low disturbance on the top, so we don't mix anything at all. And I do use it occasionally on the, you know, the chalks and the sands are, are fine, actually, but on the silts and anything that's a bit heavier, and it really helps... And I, I, I was the same as you. I was looking around for information about what it would do to the biology. And I looked everywhere. And the only thing I could find was work from America, of course. And, you know, they, they, they call it vertical tillage. And, in fact, they had pros and cons. It did, it did knock the biology slightly, but then it had improvement in the soil structure. And then the biology came back. So, I, I, you know, it would be really useful to have some work like that at, uh, in the UK, wouldn't it? OK, I think we've got a question over here. Hi there. Um, just wondering about grass weed control, uh, what levels you've experienced, what, and how you see the future without glyphosate as a, or the loss of glyphosate, and how you would manage a no-till system without it. I, 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 I really should answer the grass weed one, but as I'm in the chair, I'm going to hand it to Alistair. Um, and then we'll talk about the weather as well after that. But uh, Alistair, grass weeds, glyphosate? Uh, well, I'll pass the glyphosate one back to Phil. He's on the NFU Environment Forum. He's the chair, so he must have the answer to that. <laughs> um, uh, the grass weed one is a really interesting story. The, the problem does not follow the tillage system. It follows a combination between the tillage system and the field. Okay, and that might not surprise you. So to put that in simple terms, in one field, the black grass is worst in the plough system, and in another one, it's worst in the zero-till zero system. So it's a bit like ev anything to do with integrated crop management. It's the right cultivation in the right place according to what you're, you're dealing with. Um, we've had a really interesting situation with Charlock, 
where one field that had been subject to min or zero till for 10 years, we had to plow the one strip out to put the plow-based system in to do the comparison, and we realized how well we depleted the charlock levels in the surface of the soil over that decade when we brought up that dormant seed bank that had been there before. It was an absolute eye-opener. made us realize why that field had almost become impossible to farm. Uh, Phil, over to glyphosate. Yeah, before I deal with glyphosate, Andy, um, I will deal with glyphosate. Let's talk about grass weeds on, on your farm, and perhaps you might just want to touch on glyphosate, and then I'll, I'll mention my views on it as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the weed data in, uh, on the Lightland site, where I am on the, in, our, in our trials, has been pretty flat, basically. So we haven't really n had any differences, which is great because, you know, when I went into it, I was told that I was going to be overrun with, with grass weeds, and I haven't been. So good. Um, we do have uh, more of a problem on the heavier, on, on the heavier soils, uh, and that's where our, our varied rotation comes in. Um, the glyphosate issue I is huge, obviously. Uh, I mean, I've gone... Uh, at the moment, I've tried various different things, and uh, we do destroy crops with sh uh, cover crops with sheep. We've also got uh, a Vardastag crosscutter discs uh, that we can put on the back, and a, a little knife. We're looking at a little knife roller on the front, so we can. We tried the rolling. We don't get frosts in Kent very often, <laughs> uh, so that's not that. That hasn't proved successful, and I don't like getting up at three in the morning either. So, um, didn't fancy that one. Um, the only so. We've got this mechanical method. That's, that's, the, that's the problem, isn't it? We're all looking at no-till and not doing anything, and how are we going to destroy it mechanically? But if we can do it when we're only touching the surface, that will be good. I'm, I'm keen to do some more uh, trials. Uh, possibly, I've been speaking to Syngenta as well about this, about destroying cover crops without glyphosate. And uh, also, I, you know, can we put the right... If we put something in, say, before spring barley, we just put something in that's all brassicas, so when we destroy them, we can then control them in the cover crop as well, or the other way around. So we have, you know, all, all cereals or something before beans or something like that, and then uh, destroy them um, mechanically just on the top, and then, and then again in the, um, in, the, in the actual crop. I mean, the, the trouble, the, the, the other way is to grow, you know, we, just, we see these pictures from France, don't we, in here, with these massive cover crops, and then they dr drill straight into them, and you've got this lovely mulch on top. Um, but it, we, we can't always get them, or I can't always get them that big for a start. And I've found the drilling on the green has worked. If you're drilling, if you're drilling later, the later you drill, then you can, the later you can destroy. But the earlier you're drilling, which I, you know, especially on my light land, I get better results and better yields in because we just get droughts in Kent. And on the light land, the earlier you drill, the better. The earlier you drill, the earlier you need to destroy. So uh, I'm not sure I've given you many answers there, but, uh, <laughs> but, you've given the but you've given me time to think of it. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, so obviously the, the glyphosate question is a lot of these uh, mintil systems rely on glyphosate, and there is a huge conundrum here in the fact that it may well be outside the control of farmers and, and the industry because it may well be taken away by, by um, uh, governments and legislation and withdrawal of active ingredients. Um, I think it's trying to find, you know, wider rotations. Uh, Will Armitage would, would say the hoof and the tooth. So, you know, more herbal lays, perhaps with no grass in them as well, so that you can possibly use other chemistry. Uh, of course, the other conundrum is that um, if, if you can solve uh, a, a black grass problem on a mintil system and not use glyphosate, then, you know, I think that's the next panelist on here. The conventional way of doing it is a lot more cultivations and plowings. So cultivation and plowing, whilst it buries seed, um, does cause problems for things like earthworms as well. So they're, they're, I think um, I'm hedging my bets a little bit here, but glyphosate is a real key point of that. I think we'll go back to a lot more cultivations. And Alistair's point about greenhouse gases then, and what happens to greenhouse gases if we do more plowing, uh, soil biological activity, it, it's all in the mix. So. Um, I mean, perhaps, uh, I, I'd, perhaps I'd ask the question to the audience. Anybody uh, would like to say, uh, perhaps how we solve this glyphosate conundrum in a couple of sentences, preferably, no? So that, that, that is, the, any, 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 any words on glyphosate from the audience? Or do you think it's as tricky a subject as I do? Yes, a lot of nodding heads there. Okay, um, Mark, I just touched on alternative chemistry there as well and reliance on 
uh, one, and I think, I think the other thing is about judicious use, about when we use it, targeted use of it, and if we've done lots of other things I in the rotation so that we don't have to use as much, then that would be a good thing. What, ab what about alternative chemistry and alternative methods of, of uh, you know, cultural um, processes from Syngenta's point of view? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is an area that's uh, hotly chased right now um, because uh, uh, the, the, the glyphosate threat is, uh, is ahead of us uh, and probably, possibly more in Europe than the UK, but let's, but let's see on that one. The, um, the, the, there, are, there is plenty of research going into the new technologies. In fact, there are new products in the pipeline that may show some, uh, or are showing some signs of, um, of being uh, uh, potential replacements for glyphosate in the future. But we have to think of this as, um, as not necessarily a direct replacement. We have to think that, uh, that it is likely that there's going to be, uh, on any new product, more restrictions than, than we've got now. And that means that we are going to have to find uh, more cultural control methods to help us along with this. Um, and so, you know, work like we've done here, but also work on cover cropping and work on companion cropping as well is, uh, is work that we're willing and keen to invest in and do more with, and we are doing that across Europe. Um, I don't think there is a simple solution to this. I'm hoping, and, I've, and, I've, and I'm beginning to believe, that there is signs that the policymakers are listening to the fact that if they wish to um, drive regenerative agriculture and support uh, a much more uh, balanced approach to uh, agriculture in the future, we still need tools like glyphosate available. And we just have to hope that that message gets through before the regulators uh, decide what, what, what direction they're going in. Yeah, so I think I'd sum up that discussion. We, we need to have a balanced approach. There needs to also be a science-based approach. It can be a very emotive subject as well, so we hope decisions are made like that. And I think from the industry's point of view, those of us that are using glyphosate have to make sure that we're using it as judiciously as possible. Uh, you know, it's not... A, and, and if we're relying on one plant protection product to do our job for us, we've got some of the other things wrong, so I think we can combine those things. I think there was another question over here. You've just touched on it with earthworms, but there's a, there's a massive difference in your percentage increase there on earthworm numbers. Did you start with a lot more earthworms in one farm than the other? Is that why the percentage hasn't grown in the same way? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, the earthworms, I'm pleased you brought that up because me and Andy have got a bit of a, uh, well, there's a bit of difference in earthworms. But Belinda, you wanted to start. Uh, yeah, no, I thought I could answer that because I'm one of the data <laughs> crunchers and certainly what we um, picked up is at Loddington, we're starting off with a much higher population of, of earthworms. So we're, we're around sort of 600 up to 1,000 earthworms per metre squared to a sort of 20 centimetre depth. Whereas at Lenham on that lighter land site, w w we're typically around 60, 70 earthworm numbers. So it's a bit, bit like COVID, isn't it? The, the, the numbers, the percentage difference that you're seeing there from the two different sites is because you're on a, a very different um, starting starting point. So that that's that's why we're, we're, we're seeing those those um, percentage differences it from the two different sites. It, it's about the only thing I beat Andy on in the whole of the, the trial. <laughs> so thanks for bringing it up, and, and I'll I'll, gi I'll give you pay you the money later on. So Andy, that is a point about um, actually earthworms and lighter sandy soil. You know, in general, earthworms find it quite difficult to start. Uh, I. You know, I'm trying to build a biology. I am building biology. You know, some of our sands were kind of just orange all the way through, and then they've now, now got black at the top. But when, when it's dry, it is so dry, and all the biology just stops dead. If you haven't got water, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to pick up on that. I, I said we talk about weather. Um, so the impact of weather. Now, we've seen, even in this season here and, and for the previous couple of years, um, you know, it seems to be going through cycles, four weeks of wet, four weeks of dry, and I mean really dry, no rain. And um, trying to build that soil resilience into systems, and also on our heavy land, it's meant a lot of switching to spring cropping, which is less than ideal, and, those and many of you will have been in that position. And then you have to tailor your, your inputs accordingly. Um, how's weather impacted on your farm? 
over the past couple of years? Yeah, I mean, the, the, with the lighter land and, and the spring, we just seem to be getting these spring droughts, you know, and we go from really wet winter straight into a really dry spring, although it's changed back a bit this year, <laughs> which has probably done us some good. Um, so that's a real challenge, uh, and it's like I alluded to earlier, you know, the way we establish the crops, we've, we've got to hide them almost so that we don't disturb anything and don't let it dry out, because it will dry out, literally, I'll go into a field, I do roll after all my direct drilling, and I'll go into a field and it'll be too wet to roll, and by the time I've got to the middle of the field, it's too dry, so it's having a, it's having a real effect. What we have noticed since we've gone, we used to have really quite, when, it, when, it, when we did have those spring droughts in the past, our, our light land yields just went whoomp through the floor, and they're not doing that now. They're going, they're down, but they they are more resilient, definitely. Okay, thanks. So, uh, at Loddington in um, 2019, it's the first year in quite a few years that, in fact, ever I can remember that we didn't put any winter cereals in. In 2020, we got about 60%, and unfortunately, the 40% that was missing was winter wheat. So I'm going to turn to Alistair now and ask the question about uh, moving to spring cropping and obviously uh, a reduction in potentially in margin. Um, haven't we got to get back to trying to find systems that mean that we can drill wheat in the middle of September rather than waiting till October? Because on heavy land, it's great in some years. But if, if, if those of you that were drilling in the middle of September every year and finished by the end of September, I'm sure that's one of the areas where we've had this yield plateau as well. How do we get back with the use of the things we're talking about and what we've learned from this experiment to, to systems like that? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I've absolutely got the answer to that, Phil, but, but one, of the, one of the things that's certainly going to help us is getting our soil in a more resilient condition so that it will um, perform uh, much more under those, those sort of pressures. So I think that, that, that's a starting point uh, for it. Um, I also think we will have to be looking at more spring cropping, and I can see some advantages in that too, particularly ecologically, but also spreading workload. Um, so there's, there's a number of things there, but as you know, on our, our soil, spring cropping is something that always fills me with fear. Uh, I go from being pleased that we've done it to regretting it to being pleased again. Um, yeah, s still work to do. Excellent, right. So I, I'm, I'm just I'm looking for one more question, and while we're looking for that question, I've got another one down here. With but just before we do that, one of the things that often divides the room uh, or, or the tent in this case is whether we're all direct drillers or min tillers, or we want the plow in there. Alistair, the question I'm going to ask you is about rotational plowing, okay? Because it would seem to me that there is a case, and Tony's alluded to a little bit with low disturbance. How is, what about rotational plowing? Where's, there must be a case for it, and do you do undo all the good work if you go in rotational plow? Yeah, Phil, that's a really, really good question, and again, this is something that we've been t able to take outside of the confines of this project by using other fields on the farm. Um, and so what happens is, uh, when you plow, you lose about half your earthworms if you just do it once. Uh, but if your earthworms have done as they did on our field, go from 200 to 700, it still means you only go back to 350. So you're pretty good. What happens to all that lovely organic matter that you've put at the surface? Yeah, you get a huge plume of carbon dioxide that comes out. In fact, it starts within 30 minutes of you having plowed that soil. So one of the things to do is to plow as shallowly as you can get away with to bury the black grass below the germination zone and then consolidate the plow uh, <coughs> immediately behind to try to expel the air out of the soil to stop that oxidation taking place. And I think if you do that and then go back to your zero till, leave that seed, black grass seed, outside the germination zone. And, and a couple of things we've done here that work really well We've gone into a lay period for three years and then come out using a low disturbance subsoiler but direct drilled so we didn't plow. The other thing that's been brilliant has been Syngenta's hybrido uh, barley. Um, you will still get some black grass even in year four, but if you sow that barley, that seems to have seen it off. And we've got one field that has gone from hell to just about clear. Uh, so using that so technique. Not quite hell. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I put I I uh, 
in the first year, we knew we were going into some black grass fields on this farm that we've just taken on, and uh, we put that into hybrid barley, and it it is very clean. And uh, uh, we, we, uh, we're looking at the same, and how we do the same with hybrid wheat, because hybrid wheat is a, a new technology space that's coming along. And, um, and I don't think we can get quite the level of competition, but certainly we can get better competition with hybrid wheat than we can with conventional wheat, is, wh is what we're initially seeing. So if we, if we had another hour, we'd go on about varieties. We'd go about types of drill as well and time versus or types of cultivation. But Stafford, let's hand back to you for a final question. Uh, thank you, Phil. Um, yeah, t two parts of the question, really. Um, uh, we've spoken about black grass. We haven't spoken about slugs. Uh, and, and that sort of side of, of the question, and no doubt it perhaps it's, it's under your crop establishment um, infographic up there, and, and but it, perhaps you could tease a bit about that out, but it's the slightly negative side, but to end on a really positive side, you haven't really spoken about the bird sightings, which are, are huge, um, uh, and if you could have some comments on that, please, Phil. Yeah, as someone who's particularly good at slugs, as, uh, sorry, slug management, I meant to say, um, yeah, no, the, the, there is, a, it, uh, there is uh, issues around it. I think it's often affected with the what's in your rotation. You know, there's a lot of us going away from all seed rape. I imagine that might ease things a little bit. And did you get a slug problem on your land? We had, uh, we had kind of two peaks. When we went to Mintil, the slugs went up, and then they came, came down, and then we went to direct drilling, they kind of did the same. We uh, now, after, because we're all looking at IPM methods, you know, and we don't want to put any pellets on if we can help it. I do, after all seed rape now, I, I started off with a, a, a straw rake, but that kind of moved grass reeds around and, and pulled up stubble and things. I've now got uh, these cross-cutter discs. I just go literally one or two centimetres, and, the, you know, the neighbours, you know, and all the rape stalks are still sticking up, and the neighbours must think what the waste of time that was. But it seems to have really, really helped with slugs. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that, that's good. I mean, um, I've just... Alistair often reminds me of uh, often the first stage of uh, growth stage of um, regenerative or direct drilling is embarrassment because it actually doesn't okay. look as though there's a crop there because there's the previous crop there and it usually goes through. Uh, he often reminds me about that. But um, the, the I would just add about depth of drilling, type of drill, you know, not disturbing too much cloddy seed beds. There's a number of things we can do to try and make sure that we're not disturbing too much soil. So those of you using a disc drill will probably find that Edward, did you want to just come in quickly there? Yeah. Hold on, one moment, one moment. Although it's last question, I'm just, I'm pretty. Well, uh, yeah. No, I, you can't. Apparently, okay. Yeah. So, as a VI champion, um, you know the IPM at the end here is, um, I think, the key to sustainable farming, and things like carabid beetles, um, no pesticide use. That can have effect on slug control as well. Um, I've got a few notes here from listening. Drainage, another key thing, yeah. um, which obviously helps with the soil and crop establishment. Uh, we tend to delay our drilling in the spring when everyone else is getting on with it. The, worst, the, the most difficult thing is not to do anything and just wait and then cut it into some moisture. Obviously glyphosate plays its part in there. But there are other things we could do, like um, legume mixes. Um, we could use curb. In France, there's quite a lot of curb used. Now, I know that's a, a difficult one with the water quality, so. Uh, yeah, so that's so there's some good, good trips there, and I would, um, tips there, I would say, Drainage is really key as well. If you're going to go into this system and you're on heavy land and your drainage isn't very good, you're fighting an uphill battle a lot of the time. So thanks very much indeed, Ed, there. So listen, I'm going to just um, go around now and start with Belinda and saying if you had to give one takeaway message or key message that you want to say to the audience before they leave on their journey around Groundswell, uh, what would it be as a result of the Conservation Agriculture Project? It's been a huge, huge learning curve, and I think... Uh, the one standout for, for me has been b being able to be adaptable to the to the weather 
I, I think the weather has uh, been the, the, the number one impact on on all of the stuff that we we've done within within this project, and uh, certainly has scratched your head an awful lot at, yeah. at Loddington Hence, with with yeah. the challenge that challenges challenges you had and then unfortunately we can't control the weather and it's learning how we wor work with the weather. Mark I'm looking forward to IPM2 and what might come next what about your closing remark? Yeah I mean this for me the the big standout for it for someone who's starting farming uh, especially is the is the saving in costs and time um, so uh, that that's been a big standout but I think the other piece for us is on this IPM2 front is this only tells part of the story. This, it, it opens up more questions than it answers, actually. And that's why we want to continue to do it and run this for longer. But we want to understand and try and unlock some of the secrets of what's going on in the soil so that we understand that science and bring further scientific insights to this. And Andy, your insights from Kent? Yeah, I mean, we're making more money and it's better for the environment. So. Fantastic, but the IPM is really interesting to me. I just want to say, in the in the oilseed rate this year, in the plough plot was bare, completely bare, uh, and there's rape in the. <laughs> it's not the greatest rape in the world, but there's rape in the in the direct drilling. Uh, we found less cabbage stem flea beetle in the stems in the direct drilling, uh, and 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 with companion crops, uh, and we find a lot more money spiders where the stubble is and where the stubble's longer or eat the aphids. So there's a lot of IPM possibilities there as well that you'll find. Now there's a phrase I've heard quite a lot. It's not the greatest looking or seed rape in the world. <laughs> there's a lot of that in the, around the place. So Alistair, uh, coming to you finally there, what about, what about your thoughts, final thoughts? Well, well, I think what it's shown us is that this whole system is much more complex than most people imagine. And when we have government designing policy going forward, they need to understand that. If you just take a simple decision to ban glyphosate, you'll solve one problem, but you need to be completely aware of the other problems that you might create and what damage you might have to do to solve those problems, to give an example. Right. Thank you very much indeed. So all that's left for me to say is uh, I hope you have a great trip around Groundswell an enjoyable journey into conservation agriculture, and eventually you end up at regenerative agriculture. So thank you and very good, yeah, yeah, good morning to you. Thanks, Phil.